Thank you for coming, and please welcome Chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, Karen Bass. Good morning. Thank you. Thank Good you morning. Thank you for coming today. Thanks for having me on. Now, you were, thank you. You, you and, and John Lewis were, were colleagues and friends for many years. What's, what's your favorite memory of him? Well, actually, taking him to an organization that I started in South Central Los Angeles 30 years ago because I wanted him to meet two generations of young people that he influenced. And I wanted them to tell him specifically the impact that they had had, that he had had on their life. And that was a really sweet moment. I'm so glad we did that. So, um, Congresswoman, upholding voting rights was John Lewis's life's work. That's uh, right. But the Voting Rights Advancement Act, which he championed, has been sitting on uh, Mitch McConnell's desk for over 200 days. That's now, right. Now, we are just three months away from the election. Uh, is he going to just sit on it? What, what can you do to make sure this bill passes? Well, really... It just amounts to public pressure. But you know what? We're going to introduce another bill because when we did it before, it was before COVID. Now it's even more important because we're worried that a great way to suppress the vote is to make people have to risk their lives to go vote. And you know, people should be able to vote from home. And so we're going to uh, introduce that uh, also very soon, next few days. Congresswoman Bass, I have to ask this question. It is rumored that you are on the short list to be considered <laughs> for Joe Biden's vice president. Is there any truth to that? Are you being vetted? And what would a Biden-Bass ticket look like? What do you think you would bring to it? And I, I would really love a straight answer. <laughs> so many people <laughs> dodged it. <laughs> I know, and I'm so sorry. But, you know, we'll refer those to the campaign. I wish I okay. could be more forthcoming, but let me just tell you that I am so concerned about the way this country has been torn apart over the last three and a half years, and we need to heal this country, literally, because I am worried that when President Biden is sworn in in January, and I don't want to, to take it for granted, but we're going to do everything to get him elected, that we could be facing not only a depression, but how many more people have to die? And, you know, I worked in the medical field for a number of years, right at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. And so I empathize, number one, for all of those families that have lost relatives, but also for the hospital workers who risked their lives. And so I am willing to do whatever it takes, number one, to get him elected, but also to make sure that he has a successful presidency. We have so much to do in this country. Congresswoman, uh, Vice President Biden said this week that there are four black women on his list for potential vice presidential picks. I believe it would be a very smart move, quite frankly, for Biden to choose a black woman to be his vice president, given that black women have long been the backbone of the Democratic Party, yet that support has not been reflected in who is representing the constituency in the White House. I mean, every single uh, voting bloc asks and demands for representation, yet when black women ask for that representation, uh, they're questioned about it and told that they're asking for too much. Um, your thoughts? Well, absolutely. I mean, I would love to see that. I heard that, too, about the four women. <laughs> uh, I would love to see that. <laughs> but, you know, at the end of the day, who knows better who to choose to be the vice president than a former vice president? And I'm hoping that whoever he picks, that they have a relationship together like we saw with Obama-Biden. I think that was one of the nicest things about those eight years. It seemed to be such a camaraderie. And you know that's not always the case. And so somebody who will work with him as a good partner and somebody who is willing to take on some of the challenges we face. You know, another big challenge that we face is the racial divide. Because this president, from the time he rode down that escalator, he has attacked every ethnic group. Lately, he's focusing on Asians by calling, by saying that the virus was caused uh, by China. And you know, there's been this whole upsurge in anti Asian violence. And so the healing that needs to take place in our country is racial healing as well. And you know, let's, I want to talk a little bit about this crazy virus because the state of California now is is experiencing a surge in the coronavirus cases. Right. Gilgo City is warning that uh, L.A. is on the verge of shutting down again. I mean, 
I feel like I know what happened, but what do you think happened? <laughs> and how did you get back to that place? And, and what do you need to do to get it to a level that is workable again? Yeah, you know, I think it's so sad, especially when you see all these other states who are doing all the wrong things. And California did the right things, and we did it early, we were aggressive on the state level, the county, and the city level. And so what they're suspecting now is, is that maybe when we opened up, it was a little too soon. You know, we also have extra problems in Los Angeles. I mean, in Los Angeles County, on any given day, you were talking about over 50,000 people that are homeless. And then, you know, you also can't stop people from coming into the state. So the, I, the analysis, I think, is underway. But I think the current thinking is, is that maybe when we decided to open up, we did it just a little too soon. So I think it's very sad that we might have to close down again. It's kind of outrageous that 50,000 people are, are homeless in just that one state, in this greatest country, this rich County. country. But... I know. But, you know, Trump has decided to bring back his daily coronavirus briefing. And, uh, <laughs> and I believe this is just a way for him to hold daily rallies because he can't right. go out there. He's afraid, you know, that he'll get the virus. So he's doing it on television. He, there was not one doctor there yesterday. So, you know, these are not uh, um, task forces about the virus at all. It's about him. But why do you think he's bringing the briefings back at all? Well, and he, I'm sure that a lot of people in his team have told him it's a bad idea because he always sticks his foot in his mouth. And yet he keeps doing it. What, what do you think is, uh, right. uh, he's doing it for? Mm -hmm. Well, well. For, first of all, we know that he fundamentally doesn't believe in science, but also that he just can't survive without adulation. And, and I know he's not going to get adulation from a briefing, but he will when it is repeated on a particular TV network and when they lavish on the praise. I think it is so sad. You know, it just hurts my heart. 142,000 people have died. You know, I say that several times a day because I think it is so profound. And sometimes, you know, you can kind of become numb to it. But those were individuals. Those were families. And, uh, and the idea that he doesn't seem to be capable of empathy, he has never even made reference to the people. And he's also has been willing to subject his own supporters to danger as well by wanting to hold rallies. And after every rally, what happens? People get sick, including his Secret Service. So I think he does it for adulation, and I think he does it for adulation that's going to take place in the media, uh, on Fox, afterwards, throughout the day and the evening. How sad.